Come in the middle of that. How many of you got Easter eggs and goodies? Y'all have come in. Come on, come on. I don't think I have enough here. Maybe I do. How many of you got Easter eggs and stuff this morning? Did you get some good ones? You know, I used to run a ministry that owned stock in Hershey Canyon. And if I needed a little extra money to run that ministry, do you know what a really good time to sell Hershey stock was? I don't know. They just didn't seem Right at Easter. You know why? Because Hershey takes a lot of chocolate that doesn't always go into Hershey's chocolate. Sometimes it goes into other chocolate. And they make a whole lot of it and sell a whole lot of it right about Easter. And I have no chocolate candy for you this morning. <laughs> but I have an Easter egg for you. Okay? Now, you cannot open it until I tell you to. Okay? All right. Nobody open it. Take one. Just one. Oh, take one, take one. What you doing to your arm there, bud? <laughs> you, you should carry a pen to have all the girls sign your pen. Pass it around over there. All right, come on. Everybody get one. Everybody get one. Don't open it. No. How do you know there's nothing in there? Shh. Nobody opens it. Everybody get one? Okay. Now, you can, this is the most important Easter egg you will ever get. You may open it. There's nothing in it. And you know what that is to remind you of? The tomb. Jesus' grave is empty. And he is risen. And he is alive. So you know what I want you to do when you go home? I want you to put this somewhere where it won't be put away at Easter time. I want you to kind of leave it on your desk or on your nightstand or something. So it will always remind you that Jesus is alive. And he's alive forevermore. Alright? Let me pray. Father, thank you for these boys and girls. We pray your blessing. And we pray your blessing on this day. In Jesus' name. Alright, boys and girls. Thank you. If you stand with us again, we're going to be crowned with a big crown. We are going to be crowned with a
Father God, you rode in last week. And you knew that the people who cried, Hosanna, glory in the highest, that those people would be the ones that you would crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Father God, where you died on Friday, and they thought that they had won and you had lost, but it was not over. Of course, Sunday was coming. Father God, it is here, and you are here. You're filling this place. Father God, we thank you for dying for us, for we are so not worthy. We are so small in comparison to you and your mighty powers. Father God, let us know how real the cross was, and your death was, but yet more, that your resurrection was. Father God, fill our hearts and minds today with your presence and your peace and your power and what you want us to hear. And let us reflect on the one main thing, Jesus Christ. Father God, hear the words of Dr. Mike to preach. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. In your name we pray. Amen. Somewhere there is special grace for preschool teachers, especially preschool Sunday school teachers because they are volunteers. We don't pay them to be there. We don't pay them to do that. They are volunteers. One such preschool Sunday school teacher was once relating uh, a conversation she overheard between several members of her class as they were getting ready for Easter Sunday morning and Sunday school. Um, little Maria threw out the question, who loves God? And all the kids, oh, we all love God, you know. And she said, then, and, and Billy said, well, I love Jesus too. And Maria protested and said, but he died. But Billy said, but every Easter Sunday he rises from the dead. <laughs> Now, to be sure, Billy's understanding of Easter is still developing. He hadn't quite gotten to where he needs to be yet. But you hang around the preacher's office very often this time of year, and you will hear or read or see questions like, how can I possibly believe in the resurrection of Christ? That was a long time ago, and we really don't have any external proof outside of the Bible that he is alive. Actually, we do, but we, yeah, that's another story at another time. Then you'll hear questions like, how do we know it all happened? I mean... Dead men don't normally rise from the dead. Some of you may know who Richard Dawkins is. He is a world-class atheist. And <clears throat> he is one of the world's foremost atheists. And he, of course, wants to declare that atheists are smart and all of us religious folk are dumb. But recently, as well as, as early as a year ago, he changed his tune a little bit. Not much, just, you know, just a hair. When he said that he may not be an atheist, he may be an agnostic, because there are just some things he cannot explain. Now, I don't care. How many of you noticed what the title of the sermon is? Mm -hmm. Easter eggs, bunny rabbits, and crosses. That was just to get you in here. <laughs> okay. We really don't have a lot to do with Easter eggs and bunny rabbits. Here's the only part that has to do with it. You know, every time this year there is an argument, well, we can't call it Easter because, you know, Easter comes from the word after all, and that was the goddess of fertility, and we can't really just call it Easter. We have to call it, you know, I really don't care. I call it Easter because that's what everybody else calls it, and I want to talk to them about the resurrection. If I'm going to talk to them about the resurrection, i got to talk to them in a language they understand, so I use Easter, and I really don't care. And, and you know, you can get all upset about bunny rabbits and Easter eggs, and you know what? Bring it on. All the Easter eggs were filled with chocolate, and you don't want to bring it to me. I'll take care of it. I really will. But, you call it, you know, Resurrection Sunday if you want to. But all of that argument, I think Satan brings that argument up. I really do. I think he brings it up because it takes us away from the real truth of Easter. It takes us away from the power of Easter. It takes us away from the power of the resurrection. How do you answer the questions about whether we believe in the resurrection of Christ or how do we know it all happened? How do we answer those questions are earth shattering. Now, you know, most Easter sermons will deal with Matthew 28 or they'll deal with the end of John's Gospel. Or they'll deal with a passage in the New Testament later in the letters of Paul where he talks about the resurrection. I have chosen a passage this morning that is a little unusual for an Easter sermon. But it's in John the 20th uh, see, well, get the chapter, right? John the 20th chapter, beginning in verse 24. And if you're our guest, you probably don't normally do this, but it's an old tradition I come from, that when we read the Word of God, we stand in its honor. So I'm going to ask you to turn with me to John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, and I want you to stand with me in honor of the Word of God as we read the text. Then you'll get to sit down and you won't have to stand up again for about 25 minutes or so, okay? That doesn't mean you can go to sleep. All right. Jesus is risen, so you better too. All right. Beginning in verse 24. Now Thomas, who was also called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. That was Easter Sunday evening. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, the disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. 
Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side and stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and still believe. You may be seen. I want to show you three things this morning. Three main things and a few in-between things, okay? The first thing I want to talk about for just a minute is a dead man speaks. One of the things you get to do as a pastor a lot of times is even if you're not conducting the funeral, you get to go to funerals. Uh, Nancy, I told you before, she gets to go to all the hot places with funeral homes, nursing homes, hospitals. We all get things. Even since before we were married, she got to go to those places with them. One, one Sunday, excuse me, one, uh, one day uh, during the week, a pastor had to attend the funeral. He wasn't conducting, he was just attending it. He was all by himself and he sat down. And just as the service was getting started, the woman, the wife of the deceased, ran up to the casket, which was open, and almost fell into it, saying, George, just talk to me. Speak to me, George. And she was almost climbing in with him. And the lady sitting next to the pastor, not knowing him, but leaned over and says, and George says one word, I am out of I would be. I mean, what you think about it? I mean, you know, we all love the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, right? You know, to, to air is human, to iron is pirate, right? Well, there's something true about pirate, pirate war, is that dead men tell no tales. But the Bible says one did. A dead man speaks. And it was an amazing thing, and lives were changed. You remember the first time, I mean, maybe you're like me, you grew up in Sunday school. Uh, my mom and daddy didn't see that I had a choice to go to Sunday school. It wasn't like, you know, I had to worry about little high attendance day or Easter was coming, because I knew every Sunday and I didn't have a choice. I remember one time when I was in high school, my mother had worked all night. She came home, and my dad was in, I don't know, some far eastern country, worked for the Air Force, they took him over there. And she worked all night in the hospital. I thought, this is my shop. I'm not going to have to go to Sunday school. Church. Now, the fact that I could drive myself there at this point was beyond me. But I said, Mama, we going to Sunday school this morning. My mother looked at me. I still remember. It was like 7.30 in the morning. She just got home from working all night. And she looked at me, and she's a nurse, and she said, Son, what day is it? That day is Sunday. Well, I suggest you get ready. Because you know we will be by 9.30. You know, if you're like me, you grew up knowing all this stuff. And one of the things pastors do sometimes is we assume you know it. And we don't need to do that. We don't need to assume you know all this. But I can remember a time I didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ. I remember when it finally dawned on me that it was real. Do you remember when you finally understood that a dead man got up out of the grave and walked and it wasn't a hard movie? I mean, do you remember? When a dead man, when it came to you, I mean, we read about it, preachers talk about it, but when it really dawned on you that the rules of nature were shattered, and a dead man rose from the grave. When the story becomes more than just words on a page, it will change your life. And you will do things you never thought you would. You will go where you didn't think you could go, and you will become a different person. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine last night, and, and he's very academic. And I, I, I'm, I'm amazed that I am I'm much dumber than him. And I acknowledge that, and, and, I, and I talk too much, and all of that. But... There is a danger when we take the propositions of Scripture and we just make them things we believe in and they don't impact us. There is a danger when we uh, reduce our faith to words and propositions and doctrines and concepts that we give intellectual assent to, but we don't acknowledge make an impact in our life. Now, don't get me wrong. I spent 12 years of my life studying those doctrines, concepts, and that sort of thing, and they are important, and we need to know them. But if you will note with me, the Bible doesn't go out of its way to prove the resurrection. Most of the time, I mean, our text is one of the rare times when Jesus seeks to prove it. Most of the time, he just showed up and said, Hi, it's me. I mean, most of the first time, first Easter Sunday, he just, doors locked, and boom, he's there and says, How you doing? God's peace be with you. And, you know, that's like George talking, you know? I mean, I'm out of here. They were amazed, but... Most of the time he did that. In fact, in verse 24, Thomas wasn't there. You see what you missed when you missed Sunday school? Jesus was there, and because Thomas was at St. Mattress somewhere, <laughs> it's like a Hagen guy, the rest of you get St. Mattress. He missed it. And that's why you don't miss Sunday school, because if you do, you're liable to miss Jesus, and you don't want to ever do that. <laughs> but, John, but Jesus loved Thomas and needed him to believe, and so he came to prove it. When we really get the truth of this event, it will make us faithful when we want to run. I've been reading a book, and I'm probably going to talk about it more than you'll ever want to hear, by Eric Metaxas called Bonhoeffer, Pastor, Martyr, Prophet, and Sly. 
It is a long book. It's over 600 pages long, and I'm about halfway through it. I have to take some of it in pieces. I mean, Bonhoeffer was so deep, he was a German pastor, and he was so deep, and so I just have to take pieces of it. But do you know, in 1939, knowing that he was on Hitler's list, he was pastor of two Lutheran churches in England. And he left the relative safety of England to return to Berlin. And he didn't do it because somebody posted it on Facebook, this warm fuzzy, that if you didn't post it to all your friends, you weren't a real Christian. He didn't do it because he wanted to. He didn't do it because it gave him a warm, fuzzy feeling. He did it because he was compelled by the Holy Spirit of God to go back to Germany and to stand for the truth. He did it right up until the moment the Gestapo took him out into a yard and executed him as the Allies were on the outskirts of Berlin. You see, if we reduce our truth, our faith, to just words and concepts, it's like going to a thirsty man in the desert and showing him a picture of a glass of ice water. It looks really good, but that picture's not going to do much for his thirst. There's a curious painting by an Italian artist by the name of Caravaggio. I encourage you to go home and Google it. Uh, it was painted around 1601, and it depicts the events of our text. With a little artistic license, just a little. It shows Jesus, and he has pulled his robe aside, and you can see the wound in his side. Okay? And he is, and two disciples are looking on over his shoulder, and he takes Thomas's hand, and he is taking Thomas's hand, finger, and putting it into the wound. Now, the scripture doesn't record. He said he invited Thomas to do that. But the scripture doesn't say Thomas did it. But the interesting note is the author paints Thomas's eyes looking away from the scar. He cannot look at it. He is looking away. He cannot see the pain our Lord described. But within seconds of that conversation, within a breath, Thomas describes him as my Lord and my God. Do you understand that no first century Jew in his right mind would say that about anyone unless he was convinced it was true. That was blasphemy of the highest kind, worthy of death if it had not been true. We call him Doubting Thomas, but don't you think for a minute he was a downer. You see, Jesus needed Thomas to believe. And that's why he came that day. It's just for Thomas. I think if Thomas had been the only one in the room, that's who he would have showed up for. He needed Thomas to believe. Now, I think Thomas would have been a believer anyway, somewhere down the road. I think he would have come to believe in the resurrection anyway. You know why? Thomas appears to be the kind of guy that's going to test things. And the genuine can always stand the test. You might want to write that down. The genuine can always stand the test. If you're one of those folks today that doubts the resurrection, I invite you to test it. After that first Sunday that Thomas missed, they were all buzzed about seeing Jesus. They had to listen to that nonsense for a week. Think about that. We get, we get the summary of the argument. We don't get the whole stuff. Thomas is sitting there telling him, I don't believe it. I can't. Dead man know it. Now, he had hung around Jesus for three years, and he really should have known that. He'd seen Jesus raise people from the dead. That had been done. All of this sounded like wishful thinking until Jesus showed up, and everything changed. Even as I preached this morning, you need to know that the risen Savior is present. He even told us, wherever two of you or more of you are gathered in my name, I will be there also. He is present. His Spirit is lending truth to the words of this feeble preacher. He is here because He has risen and He is drawing all men unto Himself. The cross of Calvary fulfills thousands of years of Jewish sacrificial system that God laid down to teach them the power and the penalty of sin. And here is the crux of Easter. If Jesus' resurrection from the dead is not an absolute space-time fact, if Christ is still dead in a grave somewhere, or if you believe like others that it never really happened in the first place, then the whole Christian faith is nonsense and we are to be most pitied because we have put all of our eggs into one basket. The resurrection. But if it is true, then that changes everything. Then everything Jesus said is true. Everything in the Old Testament, if you'll pardon me, from Genesis to Mass is true. Every part of it is true. Everything. I don't care whether you understand it or not. I don't care if you want to get into an argument about the Red Sea being parted and gotten and the Israelites walking across on dry land or the angel of death or the fraud plague or any of that stuff. None of that matters. It's all true that Jesus is risen from the dead. Then everything in it is true. And it validates it. The second thing I want us to do this morning is I want us to look at six quick questions. Six questions. 
questions and understand the meaning of the resurrection. Six questions, and I, I will try not to be long. I really will. First question. If Jesus remained dead and the tomb still contains a body, how do we explain the testimony of the 12 guys, or the 11 disciples? If you lived at the time of the crucifixion, I am sure days after the, the, the execution of Christ, the next day you would have seen tears in their eyes. You would everything they had invested, they had left everything. They had left father, mother, job, activity, lifestyle, hope. They had left everything to follow him. And he was dead. You would have seen them as cowards, hiding and sniveling. And maybe they were next. Yet, Forty days after the event, you could shut them up. You could threaten them. You could, you could kill one of them, and they would not be quiet. Peter, who had run from the, from, the, from the people accusing him of being one of Jesus, and even cursed Jesus, I don't know him, I really, I mean, curse word, I just don't know him. He was ordered not to preach in the name of Jesus, and he looked at the leaders, the very same ones who had condemned Jesus to death, and said, listen, if I have to choose between doing what you tell me to do and what God tells me to do, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. They said, nevertheless, don't preach in His name anymore. And the Scripture says they went right back out, right back to the temple, and did it again. Second question. If Jesus remained dead, how can you explain the faithfulness of the disciples to the testimony of the resurrection? This is really question number one, part two. If Jesus remained dead, how can you explain the faithfulness of the disciples to the testimony of the resurrection? All of them, every last one of them but John, would die a martyr's death. And these were not pleasant deaths. Paul, the apostle called out of time, was the only one that was a Roman citizen. He was the only one that could not be tortured before being executed. We believe Paul was beheaded because it was quick and it was clean, and he couldn't be tortured. <laughs> Not true for the other one. History records that 11, 10 of those 11 were tortured and executed horribly. You know, it's psychologically impossible to die for what you know to believe a lie. If they made it up, and that's one of the rumors, if they made it up to, to control the church or to control the people, they made it up. That means these guys are fools or crazy, one of the two. They cannot be both. Because a sane man will not die for what he knows to be a lie. These men died with the story of Jesus on their lips. <laughs> Third question. If Jesus remained dead, why would 500 people say they saw him alive? That, that almost sounds like the Bible's trying to prove itself, doesn't it? Paul calls our attention to it. The Apostle Paul says that there were 500 people still living that saw him risen from the dead. There is no historical rational reason to doubt historical records for his testimony. This was not insanity. And in that day, their testimony could have been verified. But Paul said it. Somebody could have gone back to Jerusalem and we think one person did. His name was Luke. Because he tells us that when he wrote his gospel and when he wrote the book of Acts, he checked. He talked to eyewitnesses. He talked, spoke to people who had been there, seen that, done that, and had a t-shirt to prove it. How would you like that t-shirt? I was there the day he rose. Right here. I had a cool shirt to have later. Fourth question. If Jesus remained dead, how can you explain the credibility of the witnesses? You know, we in the 21st century think we are so sophisticated. We are so much smarter than those people who lived in the first century. We're the only ones who can ask questions about how Jesus could have been risen from the dead because dead men don't get up out of graves. You know, the first century people were about like that too because people didn't normally get up out of the grave then either. They asked the same questions. Don't you know they did? I mean, what do you think was motivating Thomas when he said, I'm not going to believe until I put my finger in the nail prints of his hand and take my hand and put it into his womb? What do you think was motivating that? The same thing the lady said. George says anything, I'm out of here. People don't believe that. I want you to think about it. Every other religion in the world has to do something with Jesus. Every religion. If you, if you look at Buddhism, you talk to a Buddhist priest, you tell him you're a Christian, he will tell you what Buddhism does with Jesus. You talk to a Hindu priest, in fact, I was given a tour of a Hindu temple in Nashville, Tennessee one time, and before we were through, we got told what Hinduism does with Jesus. You talk to a Muslim, and they will tell you it is a big part of Islam what Islam does with Jesus. You ask a Jewish rabbi, and he will tell you what they do with Jesus. Every religion on the planet has to do something with Jesus. But you know what? To believe in Jesus, I have got to do a thing with Muhammad. I have got to do a thing with Buddha. 
I may sit around, I may have the opportunity to explain to you the tenets of their faith so you can understand the difference between Christianity and those religions, but I ain't got to do anything with them. The reason is the credibility of the testimony of the witnesses, the story checked out, he is alive. Five, if Jesus remained dead, how can you explain the inability of the first century skeptics to deal with the resurrection with an alternative explanation? Listen. Remember what the priest said? Maybe, and again, I'm assuming you, you remember, but let me prescribe you. After Jesus was risen from the dead, the guards who saw the angel shook and became like dead men. Can I translate that for you? They were scared out of their tunics and they fainted when the angel descended. And Jesus was gone, and the priest brought him aside and said, Look, we know that the penalty for sleeping on the job is death, but we're going to square it with your, your, your officers. You just tell them you were asleep. How they knew this if they were asleep. And the disciples came and stole his body. Probably. All they had to do to kill Christianity was produce the dead, decayed body of Jesus. And it would go. In all the might of the established Jewish faith, in all the might of the imperial Roman government, could not squash people from saying he is alive. Number six. If Jesus remained dead, how can you explain the reality of the Christian church within three centuries? Now, he's like 300 years is a long time. You need to know that in the, and, and for a historian, 300 years is going to live. But in less than three centuries, actually, actually by, by, by the end of the first one mostly, but certainly by the end of three, with no satellite communications, no communication other than by word of mouth and written letter, Christianity had covered as far as England to the coast of India. As far north as, as southern Germany to north I found things recently that say that it may have gone as far east as China by the end, or certainly by the beginning of the fourth century. Do you really expect rational minds to believe that a religious movement built on a lie can be that successful? Finally, final point this morning, third point, is that Easter is much more than a celebration. Now we'll rejoice this morning. Having you love the music this morning hasn't been really enjoyable. I'll tell you, I've enjoyed every song, every verse. I'd like to just, if we could just stop a minute and sing them all over again, I would. We probably wouldn't want to do that. But if Jesus doesn't come, it's just another part. If Jesus doesn't show up, it's just another part. We're glad it happened, but it's in the past, and we never have to answer the question, how do we know it really happened? Because it'll be kind of a so what left in our minds. Okay, we had a nice party, and that was fun, but so what? The Apostle Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 15, that Christ has not been raised, and your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. We of all people are to be most pitied. You need to know that Jesus is here. He showed up. Jesus said in John 14, because I live... You will live also. And all you have to do to live as Jesus did is to believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that God has raised Him from the dead and you too will be saved for eternity. That's it. At Easter we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus with joy, but it is much more. I'm just curious. Did anybody grow up in here having to know the Apostles' Creed? Having to memorize the Apostles' Creed? <laughs> anybody know what number 10 is? I'm going to tell you, Baptists don't like to admit this. I mean, I'm telling you as a Baptist historian, we don't like to admit this. But if we were really faithful, we would tell you that almost every Baptist confession of faith was built on the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> we just took it and baptized in the native Baptist. In fact, if you look at the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which is the last update of the Baptist Faith and Message, you find that on Google, it's Baptist Faith and Message 2000, you'll find out it's a link. I mean, it says more than the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> it says a lot more. But that's because the Baptists don't know when we quit. We just say everything. <clears throat> but the Apostles' Creed, number 10 is... We believe in the forgiveness of sin. Yeah, some of you didn't pass did you? you didn't know what number it was, did you? No. But don't you hope that's true? I mean, don't you want it to be true? There is always a suspicion in our mind that we want it to be true. We want to believe it. And what you need to know that that's the Apostles' Creed and the Bible teaches it. That there is forgiveness for sin. It teaches it clearly and specifically. And, and those of us who say we acknowledge it and we believe it, there is always this suspicion in the back of our minds that there is some sin that God can't forgive. And we've done it. God just can't forgive me. God just can't do that for me. Because I mean I've done some, I mean I've done some things, and you don't know what I've done, and you know what I don't care. 
And Peter is gone. He died. And it's gone. And it's unremembered. And he'll never bring it up again. You know, mothers and nuns. My mother went to a Catholic school. And I met a lot of nuns along the way. They are really good at giving, aren't they? Do you know what you did? I mean, like, you ever heard that question? You know what you did? I mean, oh, no, 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 no. God will never do that to me. He will never come to me and say, do you know what you did? He's going to come to me and say, look what I did. Look what I did. For you. You can stop that business right now. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead guarantees your forgiveness and seals it forever. It's hard for us to understand. As much as we talk about the resurrection of the dead, Jesus from the dead, dead does for us, it ultimately is not about us. It's about the glory and the majesty and the power of God. Now it is for us, but it speaks volumes about Him. I want to tell you what I'd like you to do this morning. We're going to sing a hymn in just a minute. And that hymn in Baptist churches is called an invitation. If you're not from the Baptist tradition, I just want you to know this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> and if, you're, if you feel like you want to do something, that is the Holy Spirit pulling at your heart. And here's the invitation. If it's dawned on you this morning for the first time that a dead man got up out of the grave and really is alive, and his name is Jesus, and you would like to have him as your Savior, the invitation is open for you to acknowledge that. And what you do, what we ask you to do, is to come forward. And if you're scared or afraid or shy, you can just turn to the person next to you, even if you don't know them and say, Man, I, I don't know what to do, but I need Jesus in my life. I need to know that my sins can be forgiven. I need to know that they are forgiven. And you tell them you want to come, and you come to the front right here, I'll meet you, and I will share with you how you can trust Christ as your Savior. We'll deal with it. You say, but well, I don't understand the whole Bible. Well, good luck. I have, I have the equivalent of a PhD, and I don't need it. That's not about how smart I am. That's about how much I don't know. You understand? Okay. You come, and I'll share with you how to do that. Second, if you're here this morning and you're a believer, you know that Jesus rose from the dead, and you are looking for a church that will minister to you, help you, encourage you, where you can find the Word of God taught and preached and sung every Sunday. And you come and tell me that you want to be a part of this church. In a Baptist tradition, we ask you to do that publicly because it is declaring your faith in Christ publicly. And Jesus told us to do that. And uh, you should want to if, if you feel like God is leading you to be a part of this church. You say, well, I'm not a Baptist, but that's okay. We'll, we'll talk with you about that, and we'll share with you how you have to become a member. If you're a Christian, you can join by statement of faith in believer's baptism. If you've been baptized by immersion, you can join by statement of faith. If you're a Baptist, then you know the drill. You've done this, been there, you know what it's done. We invite you to join us by doing that, by simply coming, and we'll move your letter to the church where your membership is. And maybe you just have some questions. You don't know what you want to do. But you want to do something. I mean, you feel, I mean, you feel this. I want to do something about you. I mean, Jesus is risen from the dead. That's news and that's exciting. I need to do something about it. You just come and take me by the hand. Tell me, I don't know what to do. I don't know why I'm here. And I'll, I'll walk through it with you. And if we don't get it all done right this minute, we'll get it done before the day, before the sun goes down today. You pray with me a minute as our music team comes back to the stage. We're going to sing a hymn and invite you to respond. Father, we thank you so much for the power and the glory of the resurrection. You, Father, are to be praised. If for no other reason, if for no other reason, than the gates of hell have shaken, the foundation of the earth is solid, and the gates of heaven, the cause of the resurrection, have been thrown over the line. We will call people to respond as you do. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, would you stand as the group leads us in singing? And if God is speaking to your heart to come, even if you have questions, you come right now. We're going to wait just a minute. You come.
I didn't want to start at the beginning with. First of all, if you haven't checked Facebook and you're outside the Landon's home, he went home late last night, late, late last night. And so they are home and tired and worn out. So you be praying for them. And for those of you who don't know, that's our minister of youth and our pianist is not here this morning. And we'd be glad to have to wait. Our friend is our other pianist and he is out. They have had a baby and uh, nobody else has ever had one before. <laughs> And some other things are going on in the bulletin. We're going to talk more about them. But on May 7th, I'm invited the Mission Service Corps volunteer. He goes down to the Dominican Republic at Haiti, and he is helping to fund and build an orphanage down there. And he, he's doing this. I mean, no, the IMB, the International Mission Board, did not have the funds to, to invest in that. And so he volunteered. So he is a volunteer. He's doing this. And he wants to come and talk to you about it. And I've known Jeff for a long time. He's a former pastor. And on Wednesday night, May 7th, we're going to have him here. And you, you should be aware that we're going to probably bring you in here, too, and because we want you to hear this. GAs will probably bring you in, too, because we want to hear this. But we'll be talking more about it with you in just the days to come. Also, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Lynn and Andy are moving. Uh, now, now it, it, the problem is, is that Andy has to get on a plane at Odark 30 and fly to Colorado as part of his work. I mean, you know, don't you wish things would happen at a more convenient time? <laughs> Some things you can't change, and they have to, they have to move. And, and they don't have to, they want to move. They're moving into a great house, but that's the kind of the time frame. So if you can help tomorrow at 10 o'clock, you give me a call, and I'll tell you where to meet us. Uh, we're going to meet at the original house, and I'm not going to give you directions to everybody, but if you can help, male or female, doesn't matter. If you can give us a hand, you can say, I can help for an hour. Hey, that's fine. I can help for two hours. Like, you can help for all day. Good for you. I mean, just, just give us, a, a, let me know so I'll know how many to plan on, and we can be there, and I think it will be helpful. I, I think they've moved a bunch of the stuff. We just got the big pieces, mainly. And so, uh, uh, so you can come help us at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. All right. Thank you, kids, for bringing your mission banks. You'll notice that they're still here, and the guys didn't count them because I'm the one that has to roll the coins. <laughs> they told me I had to do that. So I <laughs> here we go. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. We're going to stand in a minute, and our deacon of the week, Randolph Byers, is going to come and lead us in a closing word of prayer. When he's through praying, Stand still for about a minute, and then you can be dismissed, okay? Stand still for just about a minute, and then you're dismissed. Randolph, come. Come and pray for us. Why don't we stand up, please, as we're dismissed. Stand up. Lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Most gracious heaven, I'll just all thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We're so thankful for this celebration of your resurrection this morning. We're thankful for the work God's mind to us. But I ask you to go to our families and our friends to continue to celebrate this, this glorious day. Just remember, we give thanks for the sacrifice of the cross, and pray to our for the victory of the empty tomb. So with us, with us, God's grace, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.